Hello everyone, and welcome to another Room Editor tutorial. In today's video, we'll look at layers in Game Maker. As always, you can take a look at the playback bar or the video description for individual segments and timestamps. And if you don't already have a project of your own to follow along, you can try one of the many templates offered by Game Maker in the startup window. In this video, we'll be using the platformer template. Level 1 Layers after creating and setting up a room, we might want to start placing down our game's assets and mechanics. But there is one layer we need to cover, which is, well, the creation of layers. Layers define where game elements, objects, tile sets, effects, and so on, reside. They also help define where gameplay interactions happen, as well as the visual depth of elements, from foreground to background. When you open the room, you'll be taken to this screen the Room Editor. You can learn more about the Rooms part of it with our Room Editor tutorial, link in the card on screen and the video description. For this video, we'll focus primarily on the Layers tab, which is located on the left side of the screen on the default layout. In the Layers tab, you can create new layers, rename them, reorder them, and configure their properties. To create a new layer, you can click one of the buttons at the bottom corresponding to the layer type you want, or you can right-click an existing layer, then Add Layer, and select your layer type from there. You can also create sub-layers by right-clicking an existing layer, then Add Sub-Layer. That way, the new layer will become linked in the editor to the parent layer, such that if you hide the parent layer, you'll also hide the child layer and they will also get moved together when reordering the layers list. If you're editing a child room, you can right-click a layer that contains a child layer and select whether it should inherit sub-layers or layer visibility. Before we go over the different layer types and their properties, here's what you can do with all of them. To rename a layer, you can press F2 with that layer selected or click its name when it is already selected, or right-click it, then Rename Layer. Additionally, by selecting the desired layer, you can rename it at the top of the Inspector window. We'll cover more of that window with each layer type. To hide a layer, press the eye-shaped icon on the right side of it. Pressing it again makes the layer visible again. Invisible layers don't show up in-game but can still be used in code, and any object instances placed in them are still processed by the engine. The padlock icon next to the eye-shaped icon locks the layer, preventing any changes to be made to them or any elements placed in them, until you press that button again to unlock it. Locked layers can still have their visibility toggled. To change the position of a layer on the list, or to place it inside a folder, Click and hold to drag it. Layers placed lower on the list are drawn closer to the background, behind the layers above it. Conversely, layers at the top of the list get drawn in front of everything. You can create folders to better organize your layers by clicking this button at the bottom of the Layers tab. Or by right-clicking any layer, then Add Layer and Create New Folder, its keyboard shortcut being Ctrl F when you have the Layers tab highlighted. Lastly, to delete a layer, select it, then press Delete on your keyboard. Alternatively, click this button at the bottom of the Layers tab, or right-click the desired layer, then press Delete Layer. With all that said, finally, let's look at each layer type and what they do. Layer Types When designing a game, we often want to tackle multiple different types of elements – gameplay objects, decorations, visual effects, background art, and so on. To help us with that, GameMaker offers a handful of different layer types, each tailored to a specific type of element or function. They are as follows. Background Layer As the name implies, the background layer's primary job is to serve as the background to your room. It is traditionally placed at the bottom of the layers list and consists of a solid color or static image, but we can also use it with animated sprites or even as a midground or foreground. 
In this area, you can select a sprite that will be repeated throughout your background. Click this rectangle to select an existing sprite, or click the first button to create a new sprite. You can also directly edit your selected sprite with the second button, and edit the sprite's image with the third one. Next up is the layers properties. The first one, color, will give you a solid color background if you have no sprite selected. If you do, it'll multiply that color with the selected sprite. The next two properties define how the selected sprite repeats across the room. Mark horizontal tile to make it repeat horizontally, and vertical tile for it to repeat vertically. If you choose stretch, the layer will instead force the sprite to cover the entire room at once, ignoring the previous tiling settings. This can be useful if you have, for example, a simple gradient sprite that doesn't require repetition. Offset X and Offset Y define the offset of the sprite in relation to the top left corner of your room. By tweaking those values, you can align your sprite in a way that fits better with your room, especially if multiple background layers are used, or if your background doesn't tile in some direction. Speed X and Speed Y, on the other hand, define a constant speed at which your background layer scrolls. This is especially useful for dynamic backgrounds such as clouds or flowing water. You can click this padlock button to unlock settings for backgrounds with animated sprites, namely animation speed and time units. Time units defines the unit of time used to calculate the frame rate of the sprite's animation, frames per second or frames per game frame. Animation speed then tells the engine how many of those intervals of time it takes for your sprite to progress a single frame of its animation. Tile Layer The tile layer is designed to work with tile sets, a special type of asset that aggregates multiple blocks of the same size and with the same properties in a single image. Importantly, a tile layer requires an existing tile set to be defined and assigned to it and consequently that layer inherits some of the tile set's properties, namely its tile dimensions. In this area, you can select the tile set that this layer uses. You can also click on the first button to create a new tile set, and on the second button to edit the selected tile set. In the layers properties, we have offset X and offset Y. These define the distance from the top left corner of the room that the tiles grid starts. The number of tile spaces is the same as the size of your room divided by the size of your tiles in both axes, then rounded to the highest whole number. Keep that in mind if you use the offset properties mentioned earlier, since they affect not only tile collision if you have any, but also where you can place tiles. A positive offset X value means you can't place tiles at the leftmost side of your room, for example. While a negative offset X value in a room with an integer number of tile spaces makes it so you can't place tiles at the rightmost side. Asset Layer An asset layer is a type of layer designed to hold sprites, texts, and sequences, independent of objects. It is especially useful for situations where gameplay interaction is minimal, such as level decorations, tutorial texts, and fixed UI elements. To place down an asset in your scene, select a sprite, font, or sequence in the asset browser, then hold Alt and click on your scene. Alternatively, drag the asset from the asset browser into your scene. For the scope of this video, we won't cover asset manipulation and properties. We'll cover this asset list and these inspector tab alignment buttons in the next section, since these apply to both asset layers and instance layers. Instance layer The instance layer type is arguably the most important one. It holds instances of game objects and defines their initial conditions, as well as their rendering order, but not their creation order. When you select an instance layer or an asset layer, a side panel will pop up. It shows you a list of all the elements placed in that layer. 
Selecting one on the list will also select it in your scene. Holding Ctrl lets you select more than one. Unchecking the checkbox of a given element will remove it from your game's runtime, meaning it can't be referenced or manipulated by any object or script, but will be kept inert in your project until you check it again. You can use the search bar at the top to look for specific instance names or object names, or in the case of asset layers, sprite and sequence names. Lastly, clicking this rightmost button will alternate between window docking modes, which you can also select by pressing this arrow. Moving instances and asset layer elements through this list will change their rendering order. Elements closer to the top of the list are drawn further behind, while elements at the bottom of the list are drawn in front of others. This only applies to the draw order. For instance creation order, refer to the room settings chapter from our rooms video. To place down an instance of an object in your scene, select the object in the asset browser, then hold Alt and click on your scene. Alternatively, drag the object from the asset browser into your scene. For the scope of this video, we won't cover object manipulation and properties. All instances and asset layer elements, when selected, have this set of alignment buttons on the inspector tab. You can use these to precisely position the elements in relation to the room. If you have multiple elements selected, you can use the Distribute Vertically and Distribute Horizontally buttons to position them with equal distances between each individual element's origin point. Path Layer Path layers are the designated layer type for path assets. They let you place and modify existing paths, which can be referenced by objects and scripts in your room. In this area, you can select the path you use in this layer, keeping in mind that each path layer hosts a single path object. You can also click the first button to create a new path asset. The second button lets you edit the selected path in a separate window. Worth noting that, with the exception of manually defining specific numeric values for coordinates, you can already edit path elements in the room editor itself, as we'll see in a bit. The Properties tab mirrors most of the path editor window. Up here, you have a color setting that is purely for the editor useful for differentiating between different paths and their purposes. Then here we have straight lines and smooth curve. Straight lines makes it so that the points on the path connect to one another in straight lines, forming sharp edges at each vertex. Smooth curve, on the other hand, creates a curve that transitions smoothly between any adjacent three points. Notably, the curve always touches the midpoint between any two points. The closed checkbox determines if the last point of the path should connect to the first point, forming a single loop. And lastly, precision is a numerical value that determines the accuracy or smoothness of the path if smooth curve is selected. Higher values are smoother but slower to compute, while lower values are faster but more jittery and pointy. If in doubt, the default value of 4 is a good balance. Manipulating paths in the room editor is the same as doing so in the path editor. You can move points by clicking and dragging them. Clicking in an empty spot will create a new point on the path after the last point. Pressing Shift or pressing this button at the top bar will open up the Shift Path window, in which you can move the entire path by typing the number of pixels the path should move then pressing the direction it should move. Right-clicking a point or an empty spot brings you different options and their shortcuts. Left-clicking a line in your path will create a new point in between its two original points. Holding Ctrl lets you select multiple points on the path. Effect Layer Finally, Effects layers are a special type of layer that apply post-processing shaders onto itself and all layers beneath it. They themselves don't contain any game object or asset. 
Effect layers have the exact same properties as layer effects, which are present in all other layer types. The difference being that, in the case of effect layers, they affect more layers than themselves. We'll discuss these properties in the layer effects section. Layer depth All layer types have a property called depth. It determines the visual depth at which your layer will be rendered. By default, it is locked and will take on the default depth for whatever position your layer occupies on the layers list. The default depth ensures that each layer is drawn in the same order they take on the list, with top layers being drawn closer to the camera, while bottom layers are drawn further away from it. Click this padlock button to unlock it and change that value. Keep in mind that other layers with locked depths will adjust automatically to ensure the order of layers is preserved, and forcing them to be out of order might cause unexpected behavior. Layer Effects All layers, regardless of type, have a layer effect that can be applied to them. They are built-in GameMaker post-processing shaders that will apply to all elements placed within the given layer, or, in the case of effect layers, to all layers beneath it. By default, it is set to none. However, even when an effect is chosen, it can be disabled by clicking this eye-shaped icon at the top of the tab. Clicking it again re-enables it. You can select your effect of choice in the Effect Type drop-down. We won't go over all of them for the sake of brevity, but feel free to experiment with them and see what they do. Some of them, labeled in-game only, won't render in the editor. You can try them in-game or check out the Game Maker manual for more information. Some effects, for example, the clouds effect, have a lot of distinct settings that let you control more precisely their looks and behavior. Others, such as Posterize, have a single or very few settings. I encourage you to take some time and explore some effects. They can really liven up a scene, such as leaves blown by wind, ripples on water, or depth of field unfocused backgrounds. You can apply an effect to an individual layer through the Inspector tab. But if you add an effect layer, like mentioned before, the chosen effect will also be applied to all layers below it in the list. So you should make use of effect layers only when you need to apply the same effect to multiple layers. To disable previewing effects in your room while still having them apply to your project, click the Room button at the top bar of the interface, then Disable Filters Preview. You can enable it again in that same setting. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that post-processing effects have a performance cost. The more effects you use and the bigger your viewport, the more graphically demanding your game will be. Using few effects and giving your player an option to toggle them is a good way to make your game more performative and accessible for everyone. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you learned something new! If you liked this video, consider leaving a like, and if you want to learn more about the Room Editor, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future video tutorials like this. Do you have any questions or tips of your own? Make sure to leave them down in the comments below! Happy game making!